Well, this evening's lecture is about the battle of the Bibles. What is this battle all about? You will know that in the past, the Bible was a very, very important issue, and there were wars fought over this Bible, and the Church of the Middle Ages banned the Bible, and today everybody seems quite satisfied that everybody has a Bible. So has attitude changed, or has something else changed? Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Obviously, it's important that we know the Word of God. So, what is the family tree of the modern Bibles which we have in the world today? The original manuscripts of all Bibles have been lost. They don't exist anymore, so all we have is copies of copies. Some of them are very old, some of them are less old. And there are basically three, although we will actually see there are only two, really, streams of Bibles. You, the ones that are... Uh, at the base, in other words, the oldest ones, are all lost manuscripts, so they are all copies of previous manuscripts. Now, as far as the Bible that led to the King James Version in the English language, they come from the central tree. These are, they, they are lost manuscripts of the traditional text, and they come basically from the Syriac, from the Gothic virgin, versions, there's a Codex W and a Codex A, and then there is a vast majority of extant texts which make up the New Testament manuscripts, and we're talking about 1,900 manuscripts in this central block, from which eventually we have the King James Version and every other Bible except the Roman Catholic and the Jesuit Bible, Every single Bible in the world that was written before 1914. Every single one comes from here. Then there are two other streams. The one is the, uh, the one that le led to the Douay version, which is basically the Jesuit version. And the ancestor of Western family that is lost, and the text is an expansion of an original text, and there you have the old Latin version. You have the Latin Vulgate version, which the Pope declared to be infallible. You have Codex D, Codex D2, Codex E2, and the Douay version of 1582, which was written to counteract the Reformation. That's the one stream. And manuscripts belonging to the same family have the same text. They all agree closely in the wording. Then there's another tree, which is the ancestor of the Alexandrian family. And the original is also lost, of course, as we see. And there you have a few interesting documents. And these are relatively new, but they are old documents that have been found lately. Papyrus 75, Codex B are two of them. Then you have Papyrus 66, and then the most famous of them all, Codex Aleph. And from this very small stream of four manuscripts, you have the Revised Version, the American Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, and the New English Bible, and all the hosts of new ones that are coming out in all the languages of the world are based on these manuscripts over here. So in the central block, you have thousands of manuscripts, but the, this particular one over here, Codex Aleph, is one of the very oldest that there is. And of course, the old Latin versions and the Vulgate also, also based on relatively old documents. Now, so all of them come from old documents. The oldest ones that we have come from this stream over here. Does old necessarily mean good? Today, we equate old with good. Now, old does not necessarily mean good. That's a very important point to remember. 
In this stream over here, there are many verses gone, just absolutely gone. And in this stream over here, there are many verses that are just gone, that are in this stream over here. Now we don't have the original manuscripts, so the, the, the followers of this stream say, aha, they weren't in the original. After all, these are old documents. And this stream says they weren't in the original. You see what they're saying? But what if you had very ancient letters from the church fathers, which often obviously weren't as copied as much as the Bible was, as the document, and you have very ancient letters from very ancient church fathers writing to each other. Now, if I write a letter to my wife, for example, I'm sitting in this country and she's in another country, and I write her a nice letter, and I'm encouraging her, giving her a few quotes out of the Bible. That everybody does, isn't that so? So we have these ancient letters, and there are quotes of verses which don't happen to appear there but the letters are older than those manuscripts, then which one would be the right one? Which one would you suggest? Then obviously the ones that are in line with here, the center, because they're quoting verses that don't even exist in those. And that is the case, that's how it is. So why do we have these three streams and what is it all about? David Otis says, fundamentally there are only two streams of Bibles. The first stream, which carried the received text in Hebrew and Greek, precious manuscripts were preserved by such as the church at Pella in Palestine, where Christians fled when in 70 AD the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. So the original manuscripts were not in Rome. They came from the Christian area. They came from Jerusalem. They came from Syria, there where the apostles preached. That's where the original manuscripts were, and that's the logical place for them to be, because that's where the apostles were, isn't that right? By the Syrian church of Antioch, which produced eminent scholarship, by the Italic church in northern Italy, and also, by the way, the Christians in northern Italy previously received their scriptures from the Middle Eastern route and not from Rome. And there was a major problem between the Ostrogoths and those in Rome because they had different scriptures. Very interesting. So Northern Italy had the same as those in the Middle Eastern regions. And also at the same time by the Gallic Church in southern France and by the Celtic Church in Great Britain, the pre-Valdensians and the Valdensians and the Reformation, they all had the same basic manuscript. These manuscripts have in agree with, agreement with them the vast majority of all the copies of the original text. So that central stream, this is called the received text or the textus recepticus. So vast is this majority that even the enemies of the received text admit that the 1920th of all Greek manuscripts are of this class. Just about everyone is of that class. And then there's a second stream which is a very small one, and it's based on ancient manuscripts, let's not doubt that, and they represent in Greek, the Vatican manuscript, or Codex B, in the library at Rome, and this one was used to counteract the Reformation, because it says different things to the one that the Reformers used. So at the time of, of the Reformation, Codex B became very prominent. And then we have the Sinaitic text, or Codex Aleph. Now that is one that was found in, Alex, in the region of Egypt. Uh, I'll show you the place later. And it comes from an Alexandrian text. In actual fact, they are saying, now listen carefully, that a manuscript that was found in a waste paper basket in a cave at Mount Sinai and questionable manuscripts from Alexandria, where you had all this occultism, are more reliable than the received text. That's what they're saying. So these questionable ones are more reliable. In fact, the one found at Mount Sinai was thrown away because it had been copied over, rubbed out, and judging by the, the science of looking at how many times pieces had been rubbed out and rewritten, 
it seems that it has been rubbed out and rewritten in many places up to 70 times. In fact, it was so rubbed out and rewritten that they threw it away. But that is the manuscript on which everything is based today. So we have this one, and it was found on a very interesting date. It was found in 1844. 1844. So this is the youngest find of all the ancient manuscripts, and it is a very old document. So when it says in your new Bibles that this translation is based on ancient manuscripts, then the idea is planted that ancient means good. Are you with me? But ancient doesn't necessarily mean good. It just means ancient. That's all it means. Now where do these manuscripts come from? Now there's a man by the name of Oregon who was an old initiate, we'll find him in the Masonic writings, as an insider initiate. That's interesting. If I find somebody praised in the Masonic writings, my ears prick up. He was a textual critic and he's supposed to have corrected numerous portions of the sacred manuscripts. Now, this is in ancient, ancient times. Evidence to the contrary shows that he changed them to agree with his human philosophy of mystical and allegorical ideas. For example, he believed that man was divine and therefore there was not just one divine man that came to this earth. We are all divine, which is Masonic teaching even to this day. And Oregon believed in the so-called Arian heresy. Now the Arian heresy is that Jesus was not God. And uh, that God is basically, if you like, a form of pantheistic God in everything. So we basically could also have a divine spark in us, which is Masonic teaching. Now it's interesting that Roman Catholicism claims that it's anti-Arian and that it fought wars and destroyed people that were Aryan. There is no evidence, let me tell you now, there is no historic evidence that the nations that were destroyed because they were Aryan, like the Ostrogoths, for example, or the Vandals, that they were actually Aryan, because we have none of their writings. Every piece of their literature has been destroyed. We only have the word of Roman Catholicism that they were Aryan. But now I have some interesting news for you. Remember I told you yesterday that the Templars have two doctrines. One is exoteric and one is esoteric. One is for the goyim, for the cattle, and one is for the insiders. Now the gospel to the outside is non-Aryan, but the insider gospel of Roman Catholicism is Aryan. Now what do you do with that? And how do I know that it's Aryan? It's because the Pope has declared the Vulgate as an infallible Bible and the Vulgate is Arian. It removes the deity of Christ. Isn't that interesting? So what's the battle about? The present controversy between the King James Bible in English and the modern version is the same old contest fought out between the early church rival sects. So the early church had this battle because these ancient manuscripts are different. And the modern church has this battle. So both of them had the battle. There was a battle in the beginning. There was a war in the middle when the Reformation came out. A literal war, eventually, over this word. And now we have another battle looming in our time. The final battle. This will be the last one, I think. That's my opinion. So... Once again, I would like to reiterate, the argument is not King James versus other versions. The argument is received text, textus recepticus, versus the small little stream that comes from Sinai and the Vatican. That's the argument. By the way, any Bible in any language that existed before the 1900s is received text. So if you go to Serbia, they have the received text. If you go to Greece, they have the received text in Greek. If you go to any country in the world, the Lutheran Bible, any Bible, they're all based on received text, every single one. But after 1900, the modern ones are no longer based on that. 
Well, when this Bible came out, the Jesuits were called in to help. Big crisis, because now it was plain that the teaching of Rome was not in accordance with the Bible. And this is one of their statements. Notice what the Jesuits wrote. We must undermine the Bible of the Protestants and destroy their teachings. The Queen of England, realizing the damage the Jesuit Bible could do, sent to Europe for Bazaar, who was with John Calvin, to help Cartwright to write this new uh, manuscript. Uh, he took hold of the Greek manuscripts and the Latin manuscripts from the received text, and he hit the Jesuit Bible blow after blow. So, war broke out. So eventually they sent the Spanish Armada against England to make war, and they came with 136 armed ships with 50 cannons, and all England had was a measly 30 ships. These huge galleys came, they were going to flatten England because of this Bible. Well, Sir Francis Drake got up that morning. He must have been very nervous. But what did he find? A storm had come up in the night, and the Spanish galleys lay smashed upon the shores as high up as Scotland, the entire fleet destroyed in the storm. And all that he had to do was mop up. And from that day, England became a great sea power. That's history. Now, what did the Jesuits say about the Bible? Here's the quote. Then the Bible, that serpent which is with its head erect and eyes flashing, flashing, threatens us with its venom while it trails along the ground, shall be challenged into a rod, changed into a rod as soon as we are able to seize it. For three centuries past, this cruel asp has left us no repose. You well know with what folds it entwines us and with what fangs it gnaws us. They hated the Bible. The Jesuit Catechism, there is the quote, says, Question, what if the Holy Scriptures command one thing and the Pope another contrary to it? Answer, the Holy Scriptures must be thrown aside. What is the Pope? He is the Vicar of Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and there is but one judgment seat belonging to God and the Pope. That's quite a statement. Now, what is Freemasonry say? It's always nice to have the comparative documents. Morals and Dogma, the source, page 818. Regarding the Bible, Pike writes, the absurd reading of the established church, taking literally the figurative, allegorical, and mythical language of a collection of Oriental books of different ages, well, it's pretty derogatory, the folly of regarding the Hebrew books as if they had been written by the unimaginative, hard, practical intellect of the England of James I, and the bigoted stolidity of Scottish Presbyterianism. Boy, he didn't like that translation. He hated it. And how did he feel about the Templars and the Jesuit version? The better to succeed and win partisans, the Templars sympathized with regrets for dethroned creeds. They sympathized with paganism and encourage the hopes of new worships, promising to all liberty of conscience and a new orthodoxy that should be synthesis of all the persecuted creeds. So you see, Freemasonry hates the received text. It has it in its lodge purely as a symbol. That's so clever. That's so diabolical, isn't it? That's, ah, oh, forget it. So, from the birth of Christ to about 400 A.D., some Gnostic Gospels appeared, and other writings were written. Paul makes mention of this, and he says in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. So in Paul's time, were they corrupting the Word of God, yes or no? Yes, they were corrupting it. And they were corrupting it with Gnostic ideas. And this is to bring them in line with an ecumenical thinking that all religions are basically the same. We shouldn't elevate one above another. In 331 AD, and this is where the problem really starts now, Constantine ordered an ecumenical Bible. You see, Christianity was saying, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and 
all the doctrines regarding to Christianity were problematic because they were in the face of paganism. And so Constantine, who tried to marry the two, he commissioned a man by the name of Eusebius, who was, by the way, a follower of Oregon, to write an ecumenical Bible. That is to change the Word of God using Gnostic writings so that it would be acceptable to pagans as well as to Christians. And that's what they did. But the early Christians rejected these manuscripts and said they are not from God. And so they went into secret libraries and there they lay, later to be dug up as ancient manuscripts. There were about 50 copies made by Eusebius, and they were distributed, and they ended up largely in two areas, namely in Rome and in Alexandria, where you had the esoteric um, studies. For example, well, let's go to Alexandria and see what we can find. Here is the statue of Horus, the secret of the initiated one. Horus and Isis and Dionysius, these secrets were kept alive at Alexandria, and the Alexandrian library was world, world famous for its occult documents. Then, of course, the very early Christians who were Bible-based got rid of that terrible uh, information place, and they burnt the old Alexandrian library to the ground, which was a catastrophe for the occult world. Well, fortunately, UNESCO, this is very interesting, UNESCO, whose constitution was written by a Skull and Bones member, just for interest's sake, decided to restore it and rebuild it in exactly the same spot. There it is today. And uh, the lamps that they've put down, they have interesting stuff on them, like little angels carrying cornucopias, which we discussed yesterday. If you go and look at the library, it is huge, and it has all the pagan inscriptions on it that the original library had on it. It is made according to the model. All the pagan petroglyphs and the ancient sun worship symbols are on it. And this is Demetrius of Falerium, the founder of the Alexandrian uh, Library. In it, they still have some of the ancient manuscripts that happened to escape. Here you have papyrus of the zodiac sign, something that the Bible forbids. Here you have a piece of the Book of the Dead, which is the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is the counterpart to what the Bible teaches. It exalts the God of the dead. The Bible exalts the God of the living. Then you have these petroglyphs here, which are too disgusting, so let's just go away. And they have the deities in their hexagons, and Socrates, an ancient mystic. Socrates, of course, died from drinking hemlock. He was an initiate, and he released some of the secrets. And according to the oath, if you do that, you can die of the poison cup if you choose, or you could have your throat slit from ear to ear and... Uh, your tongue ripped out of your mouth, he chose the hemlock. The dead are exalted. This library is absolutely enormous. One cannot even imagine how big it is. I made one small video of it. Let's have a look what it looks like. Just to give you an idea of the size, it's absolutely enormous. And uh, all the interesting pagan symbols are there. A total replica of what once must have existed there. Well, just to show that I was there, because otherwise people think I wasn't, taken from high up in the library, it was opened by uh, Mubarak in 2002. It's spanking new, spanking new. I had to go and see it. I had to go and photograph it. And uh, here they have a statue of Prometheus bearing the fire. According to the occult writings, that's Lucifer, the light bearer, and some of the symbols on the walls, on the retaining walls. Now, let's just have a look at some of the manuscripts which Rome says are essential for um, understanding the greater gospel. And Rome placed the Bible, and that is only the Textus Recepticus, by the way, 
on the index of prohibited books. They didn't place their Vulgate on the index of prohibited books. It's the Protestant Bible that they placed there. So the early church of Antioch, as I've already said, used these Sy Syrian manuscripts, and this is a book that uh, is forbidden by Rome. The Septuagint, on the other hand, was made for Alexandria, for the library there, in 285 BC. So, interesting um, data. The apocryphal books, that means hidden things, the Council of Trent said the following in 1546, whoever shall not receive as sacred and canonical all these books and every part of them as they are commonly read in the Catholic Church and are contained in the old Vulgate Latin edition or shall knowingly and deliberately despise the aforesaid traditions, let him be accursed. So they said we must accept all of these manuscripts. Let's briefly run through them. Let's go to Tobias 6 verses 4 to 8 where it says, Open the fish and take the heart and the liver and the gall. If a devil or an evil spirit trouble any, we must make a smoke thereof before the man or the woman, and the party shall no longer be vexed. As for the gall, it is good to anoint the man that has witness in his eyes, and he shall be healed. So if you want to drive away evil spirits, demons, and then wave the gall of a fish and make a smoke thereof, and it will go away. The Bible says, And signs will follow those believing these things. In my name they shall cast out demons, Mark 16, 17. Acts 16, verse 18 says, Being distressed and turning to the demonic spirit, Paul said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out that hour. So he didn't use the gallbladder of a fish. Tobias 12 verse 9 says, For arms does deliver from death and shall purge away sin. Oh, that's nice, so you can pay to get your sins taken away. Peter says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Two opposing doctrines. Which one is right? Do you think you can buy your way to heaven? Prayer to the dead, Maccabees 12, verse 43 to 46, For if he had not hoped that they were slain, would he have risen again? It had been superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. Whereupon he made reconciliation for the dead, that they might be delivered from sin. So you can pray for the dead that they are delivered from sin? This is paganism. John 1, 7 says, Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. There's no such thing. That brings us to the Vulgate Bible. By the way, Jerome's Bible, which is the one that is used in the Vatican, the Latin Vulgate, how could Helvidius, a contemporary, have accused Jerome of employing corrupt Greek manuscripts if Helvidius had not had pure Greek manuscripts? So while Jerome was writing this Latin Bible, other scholars were already saying, hey, you're using corrupt manuscripts for this. So this battle is an ancient battle. It's not a new battle. 1545 to 1563, that was the one which was declared infallible. Now what does the Vulgate say? Our Bible says, all scripture is God-breathed. The Douhe, which is based on the Vulgate, says, all scripture is inspired of God is profitable. So only some scripture is inspired. Hebrews 11.21 says, Jacob worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. The Vulgate says, Jacob adored the top of his rod. That means you can pray to a relic. You can pray to a statue. That's where they get their doctorate from. It also says in Revelation, in the Codex Vaticanus, blessed are they which wash their robes. But the King James says, blessed are they that do his commandments. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls, these were writings meticulously copied by the Essenes. The ancient manuscripts that they copied were exactly like those found in the Bible today. So they proved that the Bible had not changed in all this time. And these manuscripts were very exciting. But then some other interesting manuscripts have been found besides this famous uh, one that was found near Alexandria, and 
that is a whole series of Gnostic Gospels. And Time magazine reported on these some time ago. Words from the past, 46 scriptures dug up near Nag Hammadi in Egypt in 1945 changed views of early Christianity. Now, interestingly, Egypt was the seat of the occult science, and these were buried to keep them safe. From whom? Obviously, the early Christianity that destroyed that ancient pagan library, and these manuscripts have now been found since 1945 and are changing the world view. Some Buddhists are saying, had we known that Christianity had such manuscripts, we needn't even have been Buddhists. Well, what do these manuscripts say? These are the so-called lost gospels that are so famous today. You have the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, and all these wonderful manuscripts throwing light on what the early Christians believed. Well, there were Ebionites, there were Marcionites, there were Gnostics, there were Thomasines. All of them basically believed in the deity of man and the non-exclusive deity of Jesus Christ. All of them. Let's read what the Gospel of Peter had to say that was dug up, and you tell me whether you think this is trustworthy. Well, let's read it. By the way, these uh, Gnostic writings are apocryphal, and therefore they are sacred. The cross talked and walked. Jesus had died the day before, uttering his last words. My power, O oh power, you have left me behind. His body was taken down and placed in the tomb, but now, as the Sabbath dawned, oops, which day is now the Sabbath? Sunday has become the Sabbath here. The Sabbath as Sunday was kept only in Alexandria, in the Egyptian realm, and in Rome. The rest of the world kept Sabbath, the seventh day. So in this one, the Sabbath has moved to Sunday. Sabbath dawned, a great voice came from the sky, is that trustworthy? Well, let's see how, rest, how trustworthy the rest is. A great voice came from the sky, and two men descended. The stone blocking the tomb rolled away of its own accord. The Bible doesn't say that. And while Roman soldiers gaped, three men emerged from the tomb, two of them supporting the other. Oh, Jesus couldn't walk when he came out. His resurrection was, you know, not quite that illustrious. With a cross following behind. Oh, all by itself. Was the cross buried with him? No, the cross walked behind. Why? Because they made the cross a very prominent symbol in those days. The heads of the two reached up to the sky, but the head of the one they were leading went up above the sky. And they heard a voice, Have you preached to those who are sleeping? So here we have doctrine of preaching to the dead. And a reply came from the cross. Yes. Do you trust this gospel? If you do, I feel sorry for you. I think it belongs where that other one was found, in the trash. <laughs> Let me take you to Sinai. Well, I was interested to go to St. Catherine's, where this manuscript, this famous manuscript on which all modern translations are based, was found. Here it is, St. Catherine's Protectorate. This is the monastery, the famous monastery. Here are the skulls of the monks that uh, were active there. And if you like, you can pray to them and get a blessing. They will answer you, apparently. I, I didn't see any possibility of answering me. They had no breath in them, but nevertheless, you can if you want to. This is Sinai, so they say. And in the church you find the symbols of sun and moon and all the pagan symbols. The famous Sinai Library. Uh, where this was found, where you have all these ancient handwritten codices, these ancient manuscripts, and the famous Codex Sinaiticus, which was found by Tischendorf in 1844. So there we have it. So it was handed over to Catholic scholars in 1844 and uh, from the University of Leipzig. Interesting date. That's Codex Sinaiticus. There you have some of the ancient manuscripts that are in that place. This is the famous Four Gospels of Codex Sinaiticus. That's my friend over there. We are going into the monastery and some of the paintings in the monastery. And then this fascinating bush over here with all these people 
lining up to pray in front of this bush. This is a famous bush. In fact, this bush has survived for thousands of years and has never, ever been watered. Never been watered. In fact, it is one of the most famous bushes in the history of the world. It is the famous burning bush that Moses bowed down to, so they say. They told us it had never been watered. I was inquiring what that pipe was there, <laughs> but they in insisted that it was a, a dead pipe, which it was. There was no water in it, but I, it's a very prickly bush, so I was wondering whether there was another one behind it, perhaps. Nevertheless, you can pray to the bush, and it can give you a blessing. I didn't want to pray for it. I thought maybe touching it will help, but I haven't felt anything since then. Now, this is the type of paganism that is being taught there. Isn't it incredible? Now, let's get to t these two gentlemen, Westcott and Hort. These are the ones that wrote, based on the ancient manuscript, the Greek text upon which all modern translations are based. Who were these two gentlemen and what did they believe? Now, everything I'm going to say about them comes from books written by the sons of Westcott and Hort publishing their own letters. So this is not what somebody says about them. This is they themselves saying what they believe. This is the horse's mouth. Wonderful to have quotes like that. They probably wish they had never done that after this lecture. Hort, as well as Westcott, rejected the idea of infallibility of the Bible, called the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, that Jesus died for you, he called it immoral. He denied the historicity of Genesis, he praised Darwin, and he denied the divinity of Christ. Does it sound familiar? Who were these people, Professor Westcott and Hort? Westcott was born in 1825, Hort born in 1828. They were members of the Broad Church, the High Church Party of the Church of England. They became friends during their student days at Cambridge University, they worked together. Westcott became Bishop of Durham, and Hort is best remembered as Professor of Divinity at Cambridge University. Well, their doctrines are so Jesuit that I wouldn't be surprised if they were two of these illustrious gentlemen. Hort's view on evolution, he says, the beginning of an individual is precisely as inconceivable as the beginning of a species. It certainly startles me to find you saying that you have seen no facts which support such a view as Darwin's. But he was a Darwinist. And uh, he says, his book drove me to the conclusion that some kind of development must be supposed. So he was a Darwinist. This is a letter from Hort to Macmillan, he writes another last word on Darwin, I shall not let the subject drop in a hurry, or to speak more correctly, it will not let me drop. And so he continues to say that he is a Darwinist. Here is another letter from Hort to Westcott, have you read Darwin? How I should like to talk with you about it. And another letter to Ellerton, but the book which has most engaged me is Darwin. Another letter of Hort to Ellerton, I had no idea till the last few weeks of the importance of the texts, these are the new ones that had now been found, having read so little Greek Testament and dragged on with the villainous Textus Receptus. So he calls the received text villainous. Think of that vile Textus Receptus. Doesn't that sound like a Jesuit? Who hated the received text, who called it that asp, that serpent? leaning entirely on late manuscripts. There comes their argument. The Sinai text was early. It is a blessing there are such early ones. Then, Hort, to Reverend Ellerton, one result of our talk I may as well tell you, he, Westcott, and I are going to edit the Greek text of the New Testament some two or three years hence, if possible. And he talks about Lachman and Tischendorf, who will supply the materials. And then uh, he says... Our object is to supply clergymen generally, schools, etc., with a portable Greek text which shall not be disfigured with Byzantine corruptions. In other words, it won't contain what the received text contains. How are they going to do this? Another letter, Westcott to Hort. As to our proposed recension of the New Testament text, our object should be, I suppose, to prepare a text for common and general use. 
With such an end in view, would it not be best to introduce only certain emendations? Only change it a little bit here and a little bit there into the received text and to take note in the margin such as seem likely or noticeable of the Griechsbach's manner? You know, if we change it completely, these British will get nervous. Let's just change it here and there and right in the margin what we think is important. So that when they read it and they read the manuscript margin, they'll say, oh, yes, we see that this probably shouldn't be that because an early manuscript, corrupt one, they don't say that, it doesn't have it. You see what I mean? That's what they've decided. I feel most keenly disgraced of circulating what I feel to be falsified copies of Holy Scripture. That's a reference to the uh, authorized version. And I'm most anxious to provide something to replace them. This cannot be any text resting solely on our own judgment, even if we were not too inexperienced to make one. So he's quite willing to write another Bible all by himself. But it must be supported by a clear and obvious preponderance of evidence. The margin will give ample scope for our own ingenuity or principle. So I suggest when you read the margins, distrust them completely. My wish would be to leave the popular received text except where it is clearly wrong, in his opinion, of course. And then he says this interesting thing. Westcott, Gorham, Benson, Bradshaw, Lourdes and I have started the Society for the Investigation of Ghosts. Okay, they were spiritists. And all supernatural appearances and effects being all disposed to believe that such things really exist and ought to be discriminated from hoaxes and mere subjective delusions, and uh, they call it all kinds of names, cock and bull club, etc., etc. And out of this developed an incredible society. In 1882, the Society for Psychical Research was founded. In effect, it was a combination of those groups already working independently. So they work with telepathy, clairvoyance, etc. And uh, this is ancient occult wisdom. And... Cambridge University Ghost Society was founded by no less a person than Edward White Benson, future Archbishop of Canterbury, together with these illustrious persons, and Darwin also attended. Now, this society, the Society for Psychical Research, is also the society which runs the esoteric side of the New Age movement today, with its channeling and its communication with the spirit world, all of these things are in there. Among the numerous persons and groups who were in the middle of the 19th century were making inquiries, there you will see Edward White Benson, Archbishop of Canterbury, his son, A.C. Benson, uh, will be found under the year 1851 with the following paragraph, among my father's diversions at Cambridge was the foundation of a ghost society. And then people like Lightfoot and Westcott and Hort were among the members. There it is. He was then always more interested in psychical phenomena than, and, than he cared to admit. Very well. So, the evolution from traditional mediumship to contemporary chan channeling has been gradual. The original spiritualism started in 1848, then came the Society of Psychical Research in Britain, and then Helena Petrovna Blavatsky took this up and continued, and she's the one that wrote, Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, the savior. Satan is the only god of this planet. That's what she wrote. That's where it came from. The secret doctrine comes from this group. Now, did they belong to any other secret societies? The answer is yes. Hort was a member of a secret society. He found time to attend the meeting of various societies and June joined the mysterious company of the Apostles. He remained always a grateful and loyal member of the secret club which has now, 1896, become famous for the number of distinguished men who have belonged to it. In his time, the club was in a manner reinvigorated and he, this is Hort, was mainly responsible for the wording of the oath which binds the members to a conspiracy of silence. Did he belong to a secret society, yes or no? Yes. Which 
binds them to silence. Does this sound Masonic to you, yes or no? Well, the Prime Minister of England was also in there, and he wrote the Constitution for the League of Nations, where he insisted that all religions should become one, and wrote an esoteric solution to that, which is also Masonic. So these people were Masons. Now, we saw yesterday that the High Initiates believed that who is God? The devil is God. Satan is God. Lucifer is God. So, Mr. Hort, are you going to rewrite the Bible while you believe that Lucifer is the Son of God? Doesn't that mean that Jesus must be made less than he is, yes or no? Wouldn't they want to rewrite the Bible so that Jesus is written out of the Constitution, yes or no? Well, do we find that today, or don't we? That's the question. We'll see for ourselves. Bring your Bibles along. Let's have a look. 1854, Hort to Reverend John Ellerton. I agree with you in thinking it is a pity that Maurice verbally repudiates purgatory, but I fully and unwaveringly agree with him in the three cardinal points of the controversy that certain uh, that eternity is independent of duration, that the power of repentance is not limited to this life. Can you believe this? He believes in purgatory and that you can repent on the other side that it is not revealed whether or not all will, be, will ultimately repent. The modern denial of the second has, I suppose, had more to do with the de-spiritualizing of theology than almost anything that could be named. Okay, he believed the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory. Does he say anything further on it? Here he is advising a young student. He wrote, the idea of purgation, purgatory, burning your sins off on the other side, of cleansing as by fire, seems to me inseparable from what the Bible teaches us. So is he teaching Jesuit doctrine or is he teaching Protestant doctrine? You tell me. He's teaching Jesuit doctrine. But it's very clever to say he's a Protestant so that Protestants will accept his Bible because this Bible now comes from a Protestant's pen. If you don't know. So, teaches us that divine chastisement and little, and though little is directly said respecting the future state, it seems to me incredible that the divine chastisement should in this respect change their character when this visible life is ended. So he believes in purgatory. What does he say about the atonement, that Jesus died for you? Well, here is his letter in Life, Volume 1, page 322. I think I mentioned to you before Campbell's book on the atonement, which is invaluable as far as it goes, but unluckily he knows nothing except Protestant theology. Okay, what does he say? Letter Hort to Westcott. I entirely agree. Correcting one word with what you there say on the atonement, having for many years believed that the absolute union of the Christian or rather of man with Christ himself is the spiritual truth of which the popular doctrine of substitution is an immoral and material counterfeit. Wow! So Jesus died for you is an immoral doctrine. Rather what is moral that we become one with him in Christ and become God. That's moral. Now who teaches that? The Jesuits and the Freemasons? Or the Bible? Who teaches that? Well, what was this man? Belonged to a secret society, had a psychic club, and not only that, he hates the received text, and he spits on the atonement. That's like a Templar. That's spitting on the cross. Certainly nothing can be more unscriptural than the modern limiting of Christ bearing our sins and sufferings to his death. But indeed, that is only one aspect of an almost universal heresy. Okay, these are the people who have trans who've created the document on which the modern Bibles are based. Do you believe they're trustworthy? I don't think so. Here's another letter, Hort to Reverend Davies. No rational being doubts the need for a revised Bible, and the popular practical objections are worthless. Yet I have an increasing feeling in favor of delay. He was having problems because the British still knew their Bibles. 
Of course, no revision can be final and it would be absurd to wait for perfection, but the criticism of both testament in text and interpretation alike appears to me to be just now in this chaotic state. <clears throat> in Germany, hardly as if all the less in England, that the results of immediate revision would be peculiarly unsatisfactory. Oh, the British knew their Bibles. This was a problem. We have to be careful and sneaky with what we are going to do. Then he says, <clears throat> well, let's first read what it says down here. It is, of course, true that we can only know God through human forms, but then I think the whole Bible echoes the language of Genesis 1.27 and so assures us that human forms are divine forms. Gotcha, Mr. Hort. What is he saying? He's saying we are God. We are God. Who teaches that? Satan teaches that. Now listen to this. 1 John 5 verse 7 <clears throat> in the King James. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. What does that make Jesus? <coughs> Makes him God. You will search in vain in the modern Bibles for that verse. You won't find it in the NIV. You won't find it in the RSV. It's been removed so that they can be God. Hort to Westcott. I have been persuaded for many years that Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common in their causes and their results. Perhaps the whole question may be said to be involved in the true idea of mediation, which is almost universally corrupted in one or both of the opposite directions. Ah, so who can mediate for you just as well? Mary can. Is that Catholic doctrine or biblical doctrine? What about the other man? Westcott writes, I've been trying to recall my impressions of La Salette. That's interesting. La Salette. We'll be talking about La Salette, a Marian shrine. I wish I could see what forgotten truth Mariolatry bears witness and how we can practically set forth the teachings of the miracles. Well, Mr. Westcott, so you want to bring Mariolity in and make Jesus less? Isn't that interesting? Let's look at this picture again. In an Islamic country, Mary on the spiral, standing on top. Here we have Holy Mary, Queen, circle with a dot in it. Do you remember what Albert Pike said that was? That was the generating principle, like the ship and the mast. Same thing. They use that symbol for Mary. Oh, here's another place. Can you see that over there? There she stands. This is in southern Africa, on the spiral. What is this? That's the Tower of Babel. Here we see it from the front. This one over here in Lebanon. I took this one myself in Lebanon. There she is on top of the Tower of Babel. So who's going to be queen of the new Babylon? Mary. But who is Mary? Mary is Isis. Is she? Here is this church where her figure is with this uh, Phoenician ship over there. There you can see her silhouette through the window, and there's the painting of her. She is the queen of Babylon. Let's ask Blavatsky whether this is so. Secret doctrine. It is mankind which has become the serpent of Genesis and thus causes daily and hourly the fall of sin, celestial Virgil, which thus becomes the celestial version, which thus becomes mother of gods and devils at one and the same time. She is the ever-loving beneficent deity to all those who stir her soul and heart. That's the secret doctrine. She says, Lucifer is divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost and Satan at one and the same time. So, Satan, Mary, one and the same thing. In Blavatsky's work, Isis Unveiled, she says, Isis, the Egyptian, had the following. Holy Isis, universal mother, mother of gods, mother of Horus, Nate, Mother soul of the universe, virgin sacred earth, mother of all virtues, illustrious Isis, mirror justice, sacred lotus, sister of Astarta, ba -ba -ba moon, queen of heaven, model of all mothers, Isis is a virgin mother. Then she continues, in Hinduism, same thing. 
It's Holy Nari, Mariama. Interesting. Mother of perpetual fecundity, mother of the incarnate God, mother of Krishna, eternal virginity. All the same features all the way through. Then we go to Isis, Roman Catholic litany of the verses. Same book. This is secret doctrine. Uh, at least Isis unveiled. Holy Mary, mother of divine grace, mother of God, mother of Christ, virgin of virgins, morning star, very interesting, mystical rose, queen of heaven, all the same titles. Isis Mary. Now notice this is Isis unveiled. This is Helena Petrovna Blavatsky speaking herself. When Cyril, the bishop of Alexandria, oh well, what can you expect? Of course it was Alexandria had openly embraced the cause of Isis, the Egyptian goddess, and had anthropomorphized her into Mary, the mother of God, and the Trinitarian controversy had taken place. From that moment, the Egyptian doctrine of the emanation of the creative God of Emphet began to be tortured in a thousand ways until the councils had agreed upon the adoption of it as it now stands. So there you have it. There it is. The Bishop of Alexandria made Isis into Mary. So it's the same old worship. So if you go into a Roman Catholic cathedral or a Roman Marian shrine, here I've photographed one in Europe. This is recent. I took this five weeks ago. This is brand new. It's nice to have some new slide. Prayer to the star of the sea. Oh Mary, star of the sea. Who is the star of the sea? Who is the god of the sea? was Poseidon. It was Osiris. Oh dear mother, I now come to thee with greatest confidence. The many miracles which had happened fill me, poor sinner, blah, blah, blah. Thou, O oh sweetest mother, O oh amiable star of the sea, do not let me go away from here without being heard, etc., etc. Thou canst help me, for thou art mightiest after God. I just put that in for the goyim. They actually believe it is God. Here's this famous Pius, the same one who catapulted Adolf Hitler to power. 1950, dogma of Mary's ascension to heaven. And uh, here is the dogma. We declare that the most blessed Virgin Mary in the first moment of her conception was by the unique grace and privilege of God in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of human race, preserved intact from all stain of original sin. Now, this doctrine is incredibly important because now Jesus has his merits because of his mother and not because of his father. Remember that. Jesus has the traits of his mother. Can I burn that sentence into your head? Jesus has the traits of his mother. That's what this doctrine teaches. I will give you the Protestant preachers saying exactly the same. Interesting. Here, Focus magazine, Maria soll Göttin werden. Mary must become a goddess. Surely the Catholic Church would not permit Mary to be openly called goddess? Weibliche Gottheit? Female goddess? Absolutely, why not? Millions of U.S. Catholics want a godly Mary. Cardinal John O'Connor and also Pope John Paul II, a great Marian honorer, are not averse to the idea. There you go. Mary is God. Of course she's God to the insiders because she is, as Blavatsky said, what? Lucifer. She's Lucifer. Westcott writes, I've been trying to recall my impressions of La Salette. I wish I could see what forgotten truth Mariolatry bears witness and how we can practically set forth the teachings of the miracles. Well, Mr. Westcott, so you want to bring Mariality in and make Jesus less? Westcott to Reverend Benson, as far as I could judge, the idea of La Salette was that of God revealing himself now and not in one form but in many. Or to Reverend Rowland, there are, I fear, still more serious differences between us on the subject of authority and especially the authority of the Bible. If this primary objection were removed and I could feel our differences to be only a degree, I would still blah, blah, blah. So, he wants to go away from this idea that the Bible is inspired and uh, the errors, errors and prejudices which we agree in wishing to remove can 
surely be more wholesomely and also more effectively reached by individual efforts of an indirect kind than by combined open assault. Though I think that convocation is not competent to initiate such a measure, yet I feel that as we three are together, it would be wrong not to make the best of it, as Lightfoot says. Indeed, there is a very fair prospect of good work if we three stick together, though neither with this body nor any other body likely to be formed now could a complete textual revision be possible. We can't change everything now. Let's do it bit by bit. We stick together, we three. There is some hope that alternative readings might find a place in the margin. So as we go from translation to translation, you'll find some in the margin, and in the next version, oops, they're gone, axed, away. And so the Bible changes. You know, if you pick up your Bibles, and you turn to the middle of the book of Acts, if you take an NIV Bible, and you go to the middle of the book of Acts, and then you page, and look how many words there are to the end of Revelation, that's how many words are gone out of the modern Bibles. From the middle of Acts to the end of Revelation. Now if man is not to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, how are you going to do that with so many words gone? Up to 60,000 of them gone. Ought we not to have a conference before the first meeting for revision? There are many points on which it is important that we should agree. The rules, though liberal, are vague, and the interpretation of them will depend upon decided action at first. It is quite impossible to judge the value of what will appear to be trifling alterations. A one word changed in a text so that people don't even notice it. Trifling alterations merely by reading them one after another. Taken together, they have often important bearings which few would think of at first. Are you with me on this one? We'll change the Bible a tad there and a tad there, and if we take it all together, well, we'll have entirely different doctrines and those stupid goyim won't even have noticed. That's what he's saying. I'm going to show you trifling little changes and you will be shocked as to what they did to Jesus Christ, our Lord. You will hopefully be shocked. Verses affected in the Bibles, a rough count would give us the New American Standard Bible, 909 verses, that's a lot. The Revised Version, 788 verses. The New World Translation, 767. The NIV, 695. The Good News Bible, 614. The Amplified, 484. The Douay, which is the Jesuit Bible, has fewer changes than the New American Standard. In fact, less than half. Amazing. And the Reformation, of course, rejected this completely, but they're quite happy to accept these ones. Very strange. Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Revised Standard Version. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace amongst men with whom he is pleased. King James, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Now what's the difference between those two? It's a very subtle change, but what is the change? Here yeah, there's an initiated few with whom he is pleased. There, God is for everyone, not two classes. This is for the initiated insider, this is for the catechumens included, cannot be, change it. See what I mean? It's disgusting. It's really disgusting what they're doing here. Luke chapter 4 verse 4, and it's not in harmony with the character of God. That's the important principle. So it's not a question of grammar, it's a question of principle. Luke chapter 4 verse 4, and Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Revised Standard Version. NIV. Jesus answered, It is written, man does not live by bread alone. Is that right? King James Version. And Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. 
oops, we're changing it all, so we better remove that or else we rebuke ourselves, right? So, let's just take it out. The word is not important today. The word is just merely incidental. What is important is what you feel. What you feel is right. God will lead you through his spirit. All religions lead to the ultimate source. Trust your feelings. Forget about the word. Isn't that the teaching of the world today? Isn't that what they teach? Matthew 6, 13, King James. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Gone. Why do they leave it out? In the Jewe, in the RSV, in the NIV? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Gone. Because Jesus must no longer be exalted. Luke 11, 2. Father, hallowed be your name. This is interesting. Your kingdom come etc. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, NIV, King James. And he said to them, when you pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Now, why remove all those verses? You see, here in the RSV and the NIV, you can pray to whom? You can have the Pope as Father. You can have the Pope. But here you can't, because our Father who art in heaven cannot be the Pope. So, let's take those verses out. Luke chapter 22, verse 43 and 44. Gone. You won't find it in the RSV. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. Why do you think they removed that text? Remember, they don't believe in the atonement. And if they don't believe in the atonement, they don't believe that Jesus shed one drop of blood for you. <laughs> Away with that disgusting doctrine of the atonement, as Hort claimed. Mark chapter 6, verse 11. If any, place, if any place will not receive you and they refuse to hear you when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet for a testimony against them. What's the, what does the King James say? And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Why do you think that verse has been removed? Why do they remove the verse which says it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah? Because they do not believe in a judgment. You see, the choice that you make, who cares? Didn't they believe in reincarnation? Whatever you did wrong now, who cares? You can fix it next time round. And even if you can't fix it next time round, in purgatory, you can burn it off. That's fine. So, let's take the judgment right out. That'll solve the problem. Then we've modified that text. Can you see how many pieces are missing? So, I'm not talking about whole verses here. We're just looking at half verses and these things. Mark chapter 2, verse 17. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. How nice. Hello, sinners. Here you come to me. This is great. The NIV, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. King James, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. To repentance. Wow. Here there's an action. This is ecumenical. Let's all have a party together. It doesn't matter whether you believe the same thing, whether you keep the Ten Commandments, whatever you do, if you believe that you can, you know, sleep around with 50 women at the same time, who cares? No, no, no. The King James says, to repentance. So, take it up. We don't need that. We are initiated ones. We are above that. Acts 28, verse 29. Let it be known to you, then, that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning amongst themselves, says the King James. Now why does the book of Acts have to have that removed in the RSV? I'll tell you why. 
Because when you decide for or against this subject, it's going to be divisive. It's going to be divisive. And they had great reasoning amongst themselves. But a spirit of ecumenism says, everybody come together, we are one happy family. Here, there is a spirit of separation. Do you understand the difference? Very important difference. So Jesus makes a difference. The gospel is a two-edged sword which strikes and cuts through to the marrow. And people make a decision based on the facts. And they either move to the one camp or the other camp. So that is why verse 29 in an ecumenical Bible had to go. Because great reasoning and a split came between them. Acts 9 verse 29. He talked and debated with the Greek and Jews, but they tried to kill him. Interesting. King James. He spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. You see? What makes the difference? Jesus makes the difference. If you want an ecumenical Bible, well, here's argument and debate, but here the debate is about Jesus Christ. He makes the difference. Revelation 14, verse 5. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are spotless. NIV, no lie was found in their mouth, they are blameless. King James. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. You see, here is a, an accountability towards a higher power. Here, there is no accountability. There could be an accountability to yourself. It means nothing. Here, it is important who rules. Revelation 22, verse 14, is a radical change. Blessed are those who wash their robes. I hope they use the right soap powder. I don't know what brands you have here, but maybe it makes a difference. Revelation 22, verse 14 says, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. Now, which one do you think is probably right? Here there's no accountability. And uh, what are you washing your robes with? What are you rush washing your robes with? Blessed are they that do His commandments. That's obedience. Let's change that. In the RSV, in the NIV, in the ASV, let's get rid of it. Luke chapter 4, verse 8. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Well, the Douay, eh, which is basically the Jesuit Bible, or the product of the Jesuit Bible, and Jesus answered and said to him, It is written, Thou shalt adore the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. What's gone? Something's gone. RSV, same thing. And Jesus answered, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The NIV, Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. All of them leave something out. What do they leave out? Get ye behind me, Satan. Now why? Why do they leave that out? The expression, Get ye behind me, Satan, was early omitted because Jesus used the same expression later to Peter in Matthew 16, 23 to rebuke the apostle. And we wouldn't want the same spirit to be confused here. And this has to do with the doctrine of Peter becoming eventually a pope. It's quite a complex issue, but uh, there's a good reason why they took it out. John 5, verse 39, Search the Scriptures, for in, the, in them you have eternal life. You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. The NIV, you diligently study the Scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. What's the difference between them? Here it is a command. Search the scriptures. Semicolon. For in them you think you have eternal life. Here it is they who are, have the initiate. On this point, the Dublin Review, notice this. This is a Catholic newspaper or a Catholic article. July 1881 says the following. But perhaps the most surprising change of all is John 5, 39. That's the one we just read. It is no longer search the scriptures, but ye search, 
and thus Protestantism has lost the very cause of its being. So they knew what they were doing and why they changed it. Because we believe that you have to search the scriptures to find eternal life. And here, Protestantism is scrapped because just they believe. 2 Timothy 3.16, the ASV, every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching. King James Version, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. They changed one little word. What's the difference? One little word. We will change, said Hort, a little bit here, a little bit there, and they won't even notice it. They're after all, catechumens, they're so stupid, they won't notice. What is this? Here, only that scripture which is inspired by God is profitable. So which is inspired and which is not? Well, that's for the initiator to decide, isn't it? That's why the Pope will tell you what to believe and you can't just read for yourself because then you are heresis. You make your own choice and that is heresy. You're subject to the penalty of death. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Mark 13 verse 14. But when you see the desolated sacrilege set up where it ought not to be. Well, this is fascinating. But when you see the abomination, this is King James, of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not to be. Why take that out? Because Jesus is pointing to two specific apocalyptic books in the Bible where we should study for the end times. The one is the book of Daniel and the other one is the book of Revelation. Blessed are they that read the words of this book, it says, in terms of Revelation. And it says, when you see this spoken of by the prophet Daniel, go and look over there. You'll find some answers there. Because they were asked, what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Check it out in the book of Daniel, Jesus said. Well, let's take away the evidence. Just remove it. They don't like that prophecy. 1 Corinthians 11.9. Now, here you have the whole question of transubstantiation, the whole mass story coming up. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. RSV, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. The unworthy is gone and the Lord is gone. The NIV, for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Wow, this, this is Roman Catholicism. This is a host. Here you have transubstantiation. The omission of unworthy and Lord therefore condemns Protestants who do not believe that the bread has been turned into the body of Christ. This is a Jesuit Bible. The NIV is a Jesuit Bible, make no doubt. I used to read it, and I still have it on my shelf, but I like to use it to show people the changes. So don't throw them away. Keep them. Make a whole series of them. Now what about the restoring the confessional? Roman Catholicism teaches the confessional. King James says, confess your faults one to another. The RSV, therefore confess your sins one to another. The NIV, therefore confess your sins to each other. The Dublin Review, this is a Catholic newspaper, July 1881 says, the apostles have now power to forgive sins and not simply to remit them. Confess your sins is the new reading of James 5.16. So was it deliberate, yes or no? It was deliberate. It was very deliberate. So they can get the confessional into the NIV. Hebrews 10.21, King James, and having a high priest over the house of God, and high priest. RSV, a great priest. NIV, a great priest. Okay? That means it implies that there can be other priests. If there is a great priest, it implies there can be priests that are not so great, also officiating, but an priest is one priest. So now you can have a priesthood, very important. 
And this is a bomber. I want you all to take note of this text. Everyone sitting here. This text is very important for you, and it's incredibly important for me. The whole church government is changed in Acts 15, verse 23. The King James. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren sent greetings unto the brethren. Okay? Who sends these greetings and this information? The apostles, the elders, and the brethren send out the first apostolic letter to the churches. The RSV. With the following letter, the brethren, both the apostles and elders, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles. The NIV. With them they sent following letter, the apostles and elders, comma, your brothers, to the Gentile believers. What does this do? This is very important. All they've changed is basically a comma. That's all they've done. It's a very subtle change. But it's a mighty, 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 mighty change. And I'll tell you why. Because here you have three groups officiating in the church. You have the apostles, you have the elders, and you have the brethren. And Peter says, you are all priests. Does Peter say that? Yes or no? You are all priests. That's what Peter says. Here, you have two groups. You have the apostles and the elders, and then you have the brethren. Now what did they think about this? Here we go. This passage is used as a foundation on which to base an argument for a clergy separated by God in their function from the lay brethren. It makes a vast difference in sending out this authoritative letter from the first council of the Christian church, whether it issued from the apostles and elders only, or whether it issued from the apostles, elders, and the brethren. Here again, to effect this change, the revisers omitted two Greek words. So they changed it by leaving out two Greek words. And now they have the apostles and the elders, and then they have the brethren. Have you heard people say, you should not be preaching this, you're not a theologian? Have you heard that? What right have you to stand and preach the word of God? You are not a theologian. I'll tell you, I have heard that many, many times in my life. I'm not a theologian. No, I'm a brethren. And so are all of you, brethren. And you have the right to preach the word of God because you are priests of the Most High. To change it, you are, have no right to preach, you are not a theologian, is Jesuit teaching. It's from the pits of hell. It's not biblical. And everybody is a priest of God. So ignore them when they say you're not a theologian. You have the right to read the word of God just as they have the right to read the Word of God. Very important changes, and they irritate me. This name, then, of priest and priesthood, properly so called, as St. Augustine said, here we go back to the Church Fathers, which is an order distinct from the laity and vulgar people, ordained to offer Christ in an unbloody manner in the sacrifice to His Heavenly Father for us, to preach and minister the sacraments and to be the pastors of the people, they wholly suppress in their translations. See the point? Augustine says, we are holy priesthood and you are just profane rubbish. We'll tell you what to believe. No, no, no. The Bible says no such thing. And that early letter, very important. Mark 10, verse 21. Revised Standard Version. And come follow me, NIV. Then come follow me, ASV. Come follow me, King James. And come take up the cross and follow me. What's the difference between those two? Here is a cross to bear. When you become a Christian, there is a change in life and there is a cross to bear. And that is Christianity. The other is what? Salvation in sin one big happy party. Mark 10, verse 21. Why would they take that out? Isn't it incredible? Just take it out. Why not? Mark 10, verse 24. RSV. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. The NIV. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Wow, even worse. King James Version. 
children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. What's the difference between those two? Well, here, you might as well give up from the beginning and rather reincarnate a couple of times. Here, better not get rich. Better give all your money away. Here, money is not the problem. It's making an idol of money that's a problem. Isn't that correct? You can be rich, but you can do a lot of good for the Lord God. You can do a lot of good. So this one is the only one that makes any sense. This one is just discouragement. My God is a God of encouragement, not discouragement. Take it out. We don't need that. We need arms, after all. If you have to keep uh, the monasteries and the nunneries going, you better take that verse out. Matthew 13, 51. Have you understood all these things, Jesus asked? Yes, they replied. RSV says the same thing. Yes, the King James says, Yea, Lord. So they recognize him as God. Curious. Oh, by the way, that's been removed many, many times, hundreds of times in the NIV. Everywhere where it says Jesus is Lord, that's gone in the NIV. John 9 verse 4, one little word changed. Notice this, how cute they are. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. The RSV and the NIV says, we must work the works of him who sent me. What's the difference between the two? It's a massive difference. In the one, Jesus is the only one who can do this work. Here we can all do it. I will show you modern day preachers in lectures to come that stand up on the pulpit and say, they could have saved you just like Jesus could. I'll show you preachers, high-ranking preachers in the world, who say that exact thing. And, well, no problem. You can use this text in the new reversions to do that. One little change. 1 Timothy 3.16, God, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of our religion. He was manifested in the flesh. Who was manifested in the flesh? Hello, would you care to look at me? I am manifested in the flesh. Can you see me? I'm flesh and bones. It's no big deal. But here, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. There's a difference. Do you see how they systematically reduce Jesus and how they take him out of the Gospels? It's a shame. It's a crying shame. And this one is the bomber. Remember that Hort denied the atonement. They hated the doctrine that Jesus Christ died for you by the shedding of his blood. Colossians 1.14, King James, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The Jesuit version, in whom we have redemption, the remission of sins. What's gone? Through his blood. Well, what's the RSV say? In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Strange. And the NIV, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's the Jesuit Bible. So basically, if you read the NIV, you're reading the Jesuit Bible. Through his blood, gone. Change in the doctrine? For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. We've had this text, but I just want to show it to you again. There it is. The for us is removed in the RSV and it's removed in the NIV. So, no difference. Acts 8, verse 36 and 37. Well, this is a sad one. The whole atonement gone. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Then he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The whole verse, verse 37. Take it out. Not Jesus saves you, you save yourself. That's how you get saved, you save yourself. 2 Timothy 4 verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. Now this is a very important little change. Wow, one little word, by, at. One tiny little Oh, what difference does it make? It makes the world of difference. At his appearing in his kingdom, 
I charge thee before God and Jesus Christ says that you are who shall judge the living and the dead by his coming and his kingdom. RSV says the same, by. NIV says in view of. Hello? What does that imply? This implies that the judgment takes place when? When Jesus comes back. Jesus is going to come back. What does the other one imply? It implies something totally different. Let's see. The King James in this text fixes the great day of judgment as occurring at the time of his appearing and his kingdom. The Jesuit and the revised versions and the NIV and the, all of the others place it in the indefinite future. Anywhere. It could happen at any time. In fact, Roman Catholicism teaches amillennianism. There is no millennium. The church reigns as the kingdom. Important point, which is also not biblical, of course. So these things have to be changed to bring it in line with Roman Catholic thinking. Now I would like to invite three people, three volunteers. One with an NIV, one with a revised standard version, if you have one with you, and one with a King James, just to come up to the front, and we'll do a little experiment. Just a quick one, just for fun. Let's do it. This is great. Will you look up Matthew chapter 17, verse 21? Will you read it to me out of the King James? Howbeit this kind of goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. This one goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. What does the NIV say? He replied, because you have... That's 20. No, I want only verse 21, please. Okay. Why doesn't it say 21 here? It's oh, Oh, it doesn't say 21. What does what the RSV say? It doesn't say either. Oh, the RSV doesn't say it either. Let's go to Matthew 18, verse 11. 18, verse 11. What does the King James say? For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Wow, that's a potent verse. How many sermons have been preached on that word? What does the NIV say? It, it says verse 10 and verse 12. There is no verse 11. There, there is no verse... Oh, okay. What does the RSV say? Same. You can't find it in there? No. Oh, that's rather sad. What about Matthew 23, verse 14? Could you read that for me, please? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. Wow clergy that is so exalted now gets one knock. What does yours say? No, 14. There's 13 and 15. Oh, the, the, surely, you know, they must be so exalted Jesus made a mistake with that verse. <laughs> Let's just take it out. What does yours say? Nothing. Oh, it doesn't have it either. What about Mark 7, 16? If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 14 and 15, but no verse 16. No verse 16. No, not either. It's important to listen to the Word of God. Now let's take that out. What about 1 Timothy 3, 16? Let's just look at that one. No, there we no go. Timothy. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. And without... Controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. What is it, first at 316? Yes. 316. Uh, it's not in here. Right here. There it is. Oh. There's a little bit of it there. The pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. And you have the same. He was, right? He was. Yes, it says, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of our religion. 
he was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. And if you take that home with you tonight, then that is the crux of the matter. The King James Version says, God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is the only one who can save you. Jesus Christ is the only one whereby you can be saved. Because he's the only one who made you, and therefore he's the only one who can redeem you. He's the only one who can open the seals of the scroll. No one else, no created being, no angel, only Jesus Christ. And if you want to prove any of the doctrines of the Bible, you better have a King James or any other Bible that existed before these early 1900s. You can take the Russian Bible. You can take the Serbian Bible. You can take the old Croatian Bible. You can take the Luther 1912 Bible. Just don't take the 1984. You will find a tremendous change. You can take any old Bible in the world, except the Douay, of course, and the Vulgate, and you will find all the doctrines necessary for understanding salvation in Christ Jesus. But any new translation, treat with suspicion. In, Afri in the Afrikaans, in my own country, the old Afrikaans Bible, Tremendous, exactly the same as the King James, the new, like the NIV. In Germany, if you have an Elberfelder Bible, it's exactly like the NIV. You can find none of the doctrines in it anymore. You will have to get a Luther 1912 or a Schlachter Bible in order to find the truth. And we could go right around the world. The Armenian Bible, fantastic, fantastic. They are now writing a new Bible version in Croatia, for the Serbian language. Forget it. It is a corruption. It's based on Westcott and Hort's translations. So, I hope tonight you have found that what you read really makes a difference. Now, let me tell you, I personally like the new King James Bible. I like it. But there are huge numbers of mistakes in it. Horrendous mistakes in it some that really destroy some pivotal doctrines. But I quite enjoy it because I put it in, because I use the King James to verify it, and I cross it out to where it's wrong, and my whole Bible is crossed out and redone and whatever. I find that fun. It keeps my mind going and active. And uh, So if you want to use another translation, just be aware of these issues, and then verify your studies with one that you can trust. And the Textus Recepticus has come down through the stream of time. It has been the one that led the, to, to the Reformation. It has been the one that people have stood and died for. And it is the one that will make a difference at the end. You believe me.